Good afternoon. It is my honor to welcome you to the first ever Joel S. Levine, MD, Health Policy Lecture at Downstate Health Sciences University. Uh, this is a very special day in that Dr. Levine is one of our most distinguished graduates. And uh, it's very special uh, because I've known, I, I, I knew Dr. Levine from early in my medical training. I first met him in 1994 when I was a young resident at Baylor College of Medicine and Internal Medicine, and I had been elected to the National Resident Council of the American College of Physicians. And Dr. Levine was chair of the Board of Regents at that time, which is the Board of Trustees for the ACP. And he was a, a wonderful man who I always learned from in terms of his passion for patient care, his passion for community, his passion and love for his family, and his passion for doing the right thing in healthcare. Uh, Joel was very passionate about that. And uh, one of the most impressive things about his career is that he, he pivoted away from pure clinical medicine uh, to go work in the United States Senate uh, for Senator Max Baucus. And Senator Baucus, history reminds us, was chair of the Senate Finance Committee uh, when President Barack H. Obama was elected. And the work that Joel did with Senator Baucus led directly to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, uh, that much of the work that he did on Senator Baucus's staff got into the final Obamacare bill, which I believe tomorrow is the 12th anniversary of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And I still remember when it was done. It was done through budget reconciliation. Uh, you know, there was a lot of churn at the White House about, uh, about health care reform. I remember going to the White House, Mandy. Uh, then I was president of Mary Medical College, and uh, some leaders were called to the White House to get uh, to, for us to give input to the president's team about the Affordable Care Act. And I just remember those days vividly trying to agitate for it. Uh, the ACP, uh, again, American College of Physicians, a little later than that, I became the 101st president of the American College of Physicians. And so we continued to try to build on the great work of, uh, of Joel and Senator Baucus and President Obama in getting that landmark piece of legislation over the wire. So I'll tell you a story on um, uh, Saturday, November 9th, uh, 2019. Uh, Dr. Levine uh, wrote me a message. And it was a mere six months or so after he was here at Carnegie Hall uh, to receive an honorary degree from his alma mater downstate. And uh, this is what he wrote to me on November 9th, 2015 at 1.05 p.m. by email. He said, Wayne, I want to let you know personally that I have been diagnosed with cancer. I want you to know how much I have valued our interactions our, and our friendship over the years. What a pleasure it has been to follow your personal professional triumphs and also to reiterate how much your kindness in awarding me the honorary degree and your heartfelt comments at the commencement were treasured by Frida and myself. He then went on to plant the seed for why we're here today. He further wrote, additionally, my more well-defined mortality tends to make one think about things differently. I was wondering whether Downstate has a need for an annual visiting lectureship focused on expanding access to care for the underserved, health policy, and or increasing diversity in the physician workforce. If there is a need, I may be interested if my estate can afford it in providing an endowment for the support of such a lectureship. He further wrote somewhat humorously, academics are not provided the same remuneration as private gastroenterologists, but I've done okay. And more importantly, my children, and thus my grandchildren, have all done better than, as it should be, he said, uh, and do not require my bequest. I hope Frida lives to 100. And then in parentheses, he wrote, I am not sure she would agree. But we have always supported a variety of charitable causes and will continue to do so whether I am here or not. 
it would be helpful to know that this lectureship is of significant help. Please let me know with Warmer's personal regards and regrets if we do not see each other again. Joel. That was the message he wrote to me, and I've never forgotten it, uh, because it, it encapsulated the greatness of the man, his humor, his understanding about his mortality, but yet how his work could be furthered post his demise. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we're here today. Uh, and uh, what you see uh, on the screen here is, I think, one of uh, a proud day in his life, uh, the, the uh, moment at Carnegie Hall uh, where he was awarded the uh, Doctor of Humane uh, Letters, uh, honoris causa, honorary degree from his alma mater. So it was very special uh, to him. And like I said, it's just the uh, unfortunate fate of life that just a few months later, he wrote me that beautiful message uh, about his, uh, his wish and request uh, that we honor today. So uh, friends and colleagues at Downstate, we have a number of our students watching virtually. Uh, this is a great man that is worthy of emulation, uh, our respect. Um, but if he were here today, more importantly, his work and what the work of all of us should be who care deeply about the health of Americans, indeed the world, uh, in terms of health policy and progress to make this a more just and gentle nation. So when we finally got the details worked out, uh, we thought it was most appropriate uh, that the first lecturer uh, be Dr. Levine's uh, niece, and that is uh, Dr. Mandy Cohen, who uh, just recently stepped down as the Secretary of Health for the state of North Carolina, where she led uh, the great state of North Carolina's uh, COVID response over the last uh, two years. Uh, Mandy was clearly uh, uh, recognized as uh, if not the best state health officer in the country, uh, near the best. Uh, she was just fantastic. She was called upon by other state colleagues from other states around the country to say, hey, Mandy, tell us how North Carolina handled this and handled that and so forth. Uh, she has a wonderful background. Uh, she's now moved on to a new endeavor in the private sector that I think she'll share with you. With you. But she's gonna put in context and to deliver this first lecture uh, you know, on, uh, again, relevant to what we need to be thinking about in this post-COVID post era in terms of health care. So, but before I bring uh, Fred up, I want to uh, have Joel's family uh, to rise and to be recognized. Uh, we have his son, his sister, his brother-in-law, and more importantly, his uh, lovely and passionate life partner for so many years, uh, the Levine and extended family at Cohen's. Please stand so that we could recognize you. Now, Mrs. Levine was just saying uh, that they're both proud products of Brooklyn College. They met Brooklyn College, what, two, two subway stops down the, green, the line, I think one or two. Um, and uh, she uh, fondly remembered that they lived in the dormitories across the way when, when uh, Dr. Levine was a medical student. And uh, Susan, his sister, uh, was one of the first if not the first nurse practitioner hired at Kings County. Uh, so great, great contributions. And uh, son Dan is here, who's uh, been very successful in his uh, entrepreneurial and business activities. His brother-in-law, who has been an outstanding uh, public school teacher and guidance counselor. And I thanked him for his service. God knows we need more good guidance counselors who believe in, in giving uh, kids in public schools uh, advice and counsel and recommendations. So thank you for what you did all those years because I know Joel cared deeply about e even that. So without further ado, it is my high honor uh, to introduce to you our first ever Joel S. Levine, MD lecturer, uh, his niece, uh, the outstanding physician, uh, public health official, scholar, Dr. Mandy Cohen. Mandy. <laughs> Well, good, good afternoon, Dr. Riley. Thank you so much for that kind introduction um, and why we are moving on to hopefully my slides. Um, I'll just take a minute to also acknowledge um, both my uncle, but really first um, my Aunt Frida um, for her generosity in um, carrying out the wishes of my, my 
uncle, which was really to be able to bring to the student body here uh, and, and the faculty an opportunity to hear from folks who are, who are in the ring, if you will, trying to make the healthcare system work for everyone. Um, and he felt really strongly that it not be purely a policy lecture. I think you heard in, um, in the email he wrote, he really wanted this to be a, about how are we going to change the system of healthcare and really to highlight what folks are doing to change how we think about access to care, about equity, and about making the system work for, for all, no matter what zip code you are born into. Um, I've been very lucky to have had some opportunities to lead, not just at the state level in North Carolina, but before that uh, for seven years at the federal level. So I've had a lot of opportunity in the, in the public sector space. And honestly, that comes from and the reason why I served for so long in government is because of my, my family and the values that were instilled in us um, about the fact that we are going to leave this world a better place. Um, so I want to thank my Aunt Frida, my cousin Dan, who is here, and of course, my, my parents, my, my mom Susan, as you heard, one of the very first nurse practitioners, pioneer in her field right here um, across the street, um, and, and my, my father as well. So um, I hope you enjoy this first, um, first lecture. I, I wanna just say one, a couple more words about my, my Uncle Joel and what he was able to accomplish. I think if you look at the shape of health policy, one of the things that you should know about my uncle is the fact that everyone can get a screening colonoscopy covered by your insurance with no copay. That is, that is a direct result of Dr. Joel Levine. Um, incredible how many people's lives have been saved by screening colonoscopies um, because of his effort, right? You have to set the context and the, the rules of the road to enable that kind of work to happen. But he also knew that it wasn't enough to just say, we're going to cover it and we're going to make it with no copay, right? Because there were so many more things involved in making access possible, but it certainly started with that government context. So um, he, he, you know, mid-career moved his family back from, from Denver all the way to Washington, D.C. to say, I'm going to take a year um, to make sure that physician voices were heard at at the highest level of government, and that was the work that he was able to do. Um, but one of the things I think that I am most proud of is not only that he, you know, changed the way we think about some structures in health policy, but he he left his university job, prestigious job at the university in, in Denver, um, and went to the safety net hospital for the last decade of his career um, because he said, I can do more. I need to do more. Um, and again, he had spent all this time in the, the academic space and certainly prestigious um, accomplishments there as a gastroenterologist, but said, I want to do more to think about how can we set up structures, and I want to go to the safety net hospital, Denver Health, uh, in order to, to make change um, at this part of my career. So I admire his courage uh, and his fortitude, but also he cared about equity before it was cool, um, right? Now, this, which is great. I love seeing how equity is at the forefront of a lot of conversations. Um, but he was talking about it and thinking about it from the very, from the very first uh, moments. And that is really because he, he truly believed that he would have not had the opportunity in his life if not for downstate, if not for the opportunity to be able to access education, um, for you know, we're an immigrant family with no money, living right down the street here, um, that this was was the opportunity to move forward, and he wants that opportunity. Um, he wants everyone to have those opportunities to go forward. So I'm super honored to be here to be able to honor him and his legacy, um, as well as share a bit about what I've been working on in North Carolina to honor um, his life and his legacy. So what I'm going to be talking about is a bit about my work in North Carolina leading through the COVID crisis. Um, as Dr. Riley mentioned, I've been the Secretary of North Carolina's Health and Human Services. Um, I was there a total of five years, the last two years through COVID, um, and it was certainly treacherous waters. I love this photo um, because you're, you're trying to make sure that you're making it through the sea and the treacherous sea of COVID down there. 
Um, and that's me in the, at the head of the boat, <laughs> looking, trying to look forward and lead, lead everyone. Uh, I'm, wearing a ma- I'm wearing a mask. Um, and, you know, the, the, the leading in a crisis is, is a, a big challenge and for everyone. So I'm hoping as I talk about this, you'll not say, well, uh, I, I hope you will see lessons in this for any sort of leadership challenge. And there are so many, right? We've been through COVID, but gosh, we have so many challenging issues we need to solve in healthcare. And some, I hope, gives you a little bit of a rubric for this. Probably the biggest takeaway for me um, in a leadership perspective is, is about how to build trust, because I really do believe trust was that foundation. It's the boat, if you will, that helped us make it through these challenging waters um, of COVID. Um, but trust is incredibly, incredibly valuable, but fragile. Um, it takes years to build, uh, seconds to break, and forever to repair. And, and as I was thinking about leading with an equity lens through this crisis. And I like the lens because she's looking out of with her uh, out out into the sea, making sure you could see over the horizon some issues. Um, Sometimes when you move into a crisis, you think, well, I can't do anything new and hard as I go into a crisis, right? This is the time to go back to basics. And um, but actually, I want to encourage everyone as you move into a crisis, it's exactly the time where we have to think differently. Um, We have to do more uh, around trust building um, in order to be able to create the response to a crisis that you want. Um, so I hope you will see that in, in what we'll go through um, in the next, next little bit. Let me tell you a little bit about North Carolina as I jump in, because any good leader in a crisis really is only as good as preparation. Uh, what do you have going into that crisis? So North Carolina had some very good assets, but frankly, we also had a couple of really challenging things, and frankly, I'd call black eyes as uh, we, we went into the crisis. We are a very large state and growing. We're the ninth largest state, and we are purple in terms of our politics, meaning I worked for a Democratic governor, but our legislature was not just dominated by Republicans, it was a super majority, meaning they could over override a veto of a Republican. So it was a lot of, of, of dividedness within, within our state. We're, we're an incredibly um, rural state, given, given our size. Um, and I put, that's why I put urban in quotes. Like, there is nothing like a New York City or Brooklyn, <laughs> like anywhere in North Carolina. Even if they tell you there's a city, they are wrong um, as a New Yorker. Um, but it is also incredibly racially diverse. So 24% of the, of the state is African American, 9% Hispanic, 2% American Indians. We have a number of fairly recognized tribes. Um, and I, I think that is inc- absolutely an asset, but um, I think it makes us a picture of what the country is, what the country in the United States is as a whole. Um, and I thought about that a lot as I led through the COVID crisis about all the challenges we were having um, across the country. We also had an incredibly decentralized public health structure, but we had some things that we were doing in North Carolina that I was very proud of as we led into the crisis, which I think really helped us to respond. But the black eye that we didn't have is we have not expanded Medicaid. So we have a pretty high uninsured rate um, in North Carolina, exactly the kind of thing my uncle would really be fighting for, which would would be Medicaid expansion, something we did not have, um, unfortunately. And that was, uh, frankly, a result of the politics of of the state. But we had made some really good investments um, that I was very proud of. One was ahead of COVID, we had already established um, an, an effort to create a way to link together the healthcare system and all of the human services and, the, and the, the, the community organizations across the state. We called that platform NC Care 360. It was a way that embeds in your EHR. So if you are referring, um, just like you would refer to a cardiologist, you could actually refer to a food bank or a housing support or to em- employment services, and you'd actually get a closed loop referral. We were the first state in the country to do this this and take it statewide. Really proud of this infrastructure. And I'll come back to it later because I think it was really important. We'd also 
already gotten permission from the federal government to use our Medicaid dollars differently to say, I don't want to just spend it on, on medical care. Again, I'm a physician, so I think that's always going to be important. But we knew that, that you needed to spend your dollars on certain things like stable housing, on food security, on transportation, if you were actually going to get health. So we had those things in the background in North Carolina going into the crisis, which I really think helped us, um, even if we went in with one hand tied behind our back in terms of did people actually have an insurance card in their wallet. Okay, so there are really three tenets of that trust building that I'm going to go through around equity that I think were really important. Um, so we had some preparation, but the first really big thing that I learned in leading through the crisis, and it's probably pretty obvious, but if you want to build trust, you need to be transparent. And I also think this is one of the hardest things to do as a leader because sometimes when you're transparent, it means you're also showing where you're weakest, where are things going wrong the most. And particularly when you think about an equity context, we already know that things are not equitable, right? And so you have the data will just, often if you are measuring it accurately, it will show that. Um, and that means showing your, your where things are not going well is really hard, particularly in a political context. Everyone wants to seem like they've got it all together and all in hand all the time. That's not reality. And I think folks know it. And if you're not being transparent, you can't build trust with folks. So we took in North Carolina the tack to say, we are going to be transparent with all of our data. We're going to be incredibly uh, focused on getting good data, even if that means we're going to be showing where we are not doing a good job. And it, and it did show that um, at the beginning. So for us, data was the oxygen that powered our response. We won all sorts of awards for data transparency. And you will see data in itself does nothing. It just identifies the problems. But you can't solve problems you don't see. Um, so it was really important to us to put a premium on that. So for example, by the time we got to our vaccine efforts in COVID, we had we we said this is so important to us. We've learned through testing and contact tracing and hospitalizations. The data wasn't very good. We didn't get the race and ethnicity data we wanted through all of that because of legacy programs. All right, vaccine, this is new. We're going to do something new and different. And so as part of that, we created our own vaccine data management system. We did not use the federal government's one. We created our own because we wanted the control to say, this is so important to us that we collect this data well. We want to control it ourselves, and we want to require race and ethnicity as part of this. So in order to give a vaccine in North Carolina, you must record race and ethnicity data. And what that means, and you got to get into the details here, is you can't say unknown. That's not, that's not a valid answer in North Carolina, um, because unfortunately, that is a shorthand for not asking. Um, and that was not important to us. So we have 99.9% .9 of all data collected in race and ethnicity, and that was really important to us because we used it every day. The way we used it every day was to say, I'm going to look at that data, look at that dashboard, and change where where we are going to put resources. I'm going to change how much vaccine goes to which communities. I'm going to decide how much money I can give to do supportive vaccine events on incentives um, to de depending on that data. So it wasn't data for data's sake. It was using it to change how we would actually do our work. So we, you see, we, we use that data to decide to give more vaccine, again, to underserved communities or to give um, uh, um, like I said, more incentives, and it it worked. Um, we didn't, but I will say, we didn't start off well. Um, as I said, if you use any of this data, you're going to see equity gaps at first, and that is what we saw here. Um, we definitely saw less vaccinations happening in our African-American community and our Hispanic community. But using that data, we definitely changed what we did in North Carolina, and by, um, as we sit here right now, for example, our Hispanic community is out-vaccinated our white communities in North Carolina, so our, which is tremendous. I think we are only one of three states in which that has happened. So um, a higher percentage of those who are Hispanic Latinx are vaccinated in North Carolina than if you are white. And in the African-American community, we, we um, got to nearly on par across every age group. So they didn't surpass in the African-American community, but at least we we got to, to, um, to equitable, which was, is a huge accomplishment and we're really 
really proud of, uh, of doing that. So embracing transparency was hard because at first it was very clear where we were falling short, but we used that data to drive our work and, and get better. So transparency, data, really important. All right, the second lesson learned around how you think about equity in a crisis is about proactively communicating. And I'll say the folks in North Carolina saw lots of this of me, which is standing at a podium like this and talking. And, and some might think that that's communicating. It's one part of it, it is. Um, but the listening is actually probably the most important part of the proactively communicating if you were thinking about equity. Um, and it was very, very important to me. So yes, it was talking so folks could know what you're doing. We could all be on the same page. You're building trust but it was the listening that was so critical as we proactively communicated because we needed to build trust. So for us, we right at the beginning of the pandemic set up a group that advised us on equity issues. We called it the Historically Marginalized Population Working Group. It was quite large. Um, at first, um, we didn't know exactly how to take everyone's input and channel it into, into ways that, that felt like we were helping the community each and every day. But we got into this place where we were really co-creating solutions with com the community. Um, they felt very empowered by it, and so did we. Um, we felt like we got a lot more out of our, our messaging campaigns and all of the work that we did to try to connect with communities because we had folks at the front end uh, working with us. But what we realized quickly is that you couldn't continue to just lean on community organizations that were the trusted members of their of their community without actually resourcing them, paying them. Like, this is their time, this is their livelihood, you have to pay people for their time and their talent. Um, and so we, we had also established a program called Healthier Together to recognize that we needed to actually resource folks to do the work of building trust, of talking about vaccines, about talking about COVID and why masks are important or what have you. Um, so it was really important for us, again, to build that together, and we use different organizations to make sure we're supporting that on the ground work. The other part, again, with building together was the talking. I did do a lot of press conferences, many, many, many press conferences, more than 150 of them uh, within 18 months, um, so that was a lot. But what what we did was we made sure each one of them obviously was, was simulcast in Spanish, and we'd often do a second press conference right after the first, all geared in Spanish, so we do the entire press conference, not just simulcast in Spanish, but with a, a with Spanish um, speaking physicians and public health leaders so that they could hear directly from leaders within their own community. And that really paid off um, as we went forward. We also invested a lot of time in market research. Again, the listening, what do we need to know about our communities? And so what came from that were certain campaigns like this one, where, where we wanted to folks to see themselves represented in something like wearing a mask. So we had a whatever your reason um, mask campaign. And so people wear masks for different reasons. They want to protect their their family, or they're wearing it because they have an underlying medical condition, um, or they care about their their friends. So we this one's really resonated in North Carolina. We won multiple awards for for this, but th the awards are not the issue. the The issue was getting the cohesion of everyone seeing themselves in this this collective effort. Um, so we are really proud of of, of that work. Um, and then the other part of of proactive communication is showing up is just being present. And I did a lot of that. Um, and you, you, um, I was able to connect with a lot of important community uh, leaders throughout the work to make sure that, we, that, that my showing up was, was critical, the governor showing up with me uh, to make sure that they knew that they could trust us, that we were in this together. Um, at the top uh, here, you'll, you'll see that um, you may recognize that as Reverend Barber who is a, an amazing civil rights leader from North Carolina, run, leads the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and he was generous enough that he and I got vaccinated together. We both got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine together on, on television. And that was really important. So we had this overlap, both civil rights, the religious community, the medical community sort of coming uh, together. 
There's another picture of me. I, I did a lot of charts and graphs. So like, again, just trying to be as transparent as we can on TV. Obviously, during COVID, getting t physically together was hard. But so we did a lot on Zoom wherever we could. But you can also see down, I, I spent a lot of time with our community health workers, which I'll talk about in, in a second, that really both helped me, folks feel comfortable at vaccine events and, and did a lot of the hard work of building those important relationships. Um, so showing up, showing up to build trust is so, so important as part of communication. And then the last, so if we had transparency and great data, you had proactive communication and building relationships. The last is around details. Um, because you can have good data, you can have these good relationships, but you gotta still point the ship and get into the details um, to make the execution happen and make it real in people's lives. Um, and I'm the kind of leader, I'm a very practical, pragmatic, like how is this helping a person today? I think I channel that very much from, from Joel. Um, very practical, like how is this going to help someone today? So you gotta get into the details. So for us, this is how some of those details took shape. We recognize that health is so much more than just access to a COVID test or even access to a vaccine. Um, we know we had to surround communities, surround families, individuals um, with support. And so one of the ways we did that was developing what we called a support services program, using community health workers to say, if you, if you tested positive to, to COVID, um, that, that we would actually help you get through it. A lot of the reason folks didn't want to get tested was because they knew if they were positive, they'd have to stay home from work. And if you're not at work, you're not making money. That means you're not making rent and putting food on the table. So we needed to say, no, you know, we hear you. Um, if you tr get positive, we'll both help you find a place to, to safely isolate. We will do wage replacement for you. We will pay, pay you to, to stay out of work um, and we'll help you with food, medicine, transportation. Now we were, so we were able to do this for two reasons. One, there was a lot of COVID dollars that we were able to get access to and we decided as a state that this was important for us to invest in. But we had had that infrastructure before we went into COVID that we could take advantage of. We had a platform where we could track all of this with NC Care 360. We had a community health worker program. We knew how to pay for these things and, and sort of make this possible. Um, so this is one real benefit. And by doing that, um, we were able to um, really not only keep folks well um, and, and not get COVID, um, we were able to certainly help those who were, were impacted. Um, you can see in the last bullet, I mentioned that, that when we evaluated this in the counties that we went to, and again, we went to counties with higher, with higher percentages of the community that were African-American or Hispanic um, or American Indian, and we saw about a 12 to 15 percent less um, less COVID in those counties once we were running these programs. So you would think it was just supporting those who got sick, but what it was really doing was helping us to prevent further spread within the communities. And so it was a really successful. And actually, we are talking uh, right now. Well, I'm not with the state anymore, but my, the state is talking right now with FEMA the CDC and others, how do we take this and make this standard practice when we respond to any kind of communicable disease outbreak, hurricane, or what have you, that this is sort of the standard of what we do, which is these wraparound support kinds of programs. In addition, we did things like huge nutrition investments. And I will say, this is where every state could have done this, but only five did. And one of them was North Carolina, and I'd never really you know, I, I asked myself, why didn't more states do this? But for example, we were able to take advantage of a federal program to pull down more federal resources for food support for families with children. I think you all know that kids get free and reduced lunch and breakfast at school. When they close the schools, we were very worried about our nutrition availability for our, our students and our families. And the federal government had this program to say, yeah, we'll let you give more, you know, actual um, just cash for groceries to those families. If, but there were hoops to jump through, as always. You have to have to do some real work to get this done. But we prioritized this. Um, and we were able to get an extra $1.7 billion um, for families in North Carolina um, over a COVID crisis. And that's real money. Um, that's real money, not just for the families uh, who uh, were buying food for, for their families, 
but for our businesses too. This was a huge economic generator um, in a number of our communities at times where things were really tight. Um, so those are the ways in which we try to both raise up public health, but also think about economic health at the same time uh, in doing these work. Similar on the childcare investments, I'm sure it was a huge um, strain for families who are all essential workers who are here um, at Kings County or here at Downstate trying to uh, you know, stay at work but still need childcare. We spent a lot of time and resources making sure that childcare was available. So those are the kinds of things we, we did in terms of making the reality possible. Yes, a lot of time spent on testing and contact tracing, and I'm not, you know, I'm sure there's others who can give you lots of um, great lectures on this, but what we tried to do was think beyond that to the, these other pieces, the nutrition, the childcare, um, and, and things like the wraparound supports in order to support folks through, through the COVID crisis. So that's, that's the, the, the essence of the lessons that I wanted to share about leading through equity. So a couple lessons learned. Um, again, advancing health equity. I thought I was a, a leader that led with equity before the COVID crisis, and I will share that I was not. Um, I am such a different leader coming out of the COVID crisis than when I went into it. I think before I had folks on my team who I assigned, you, you think about equity for our work um, and then you sort of move on with your day. That is not leading with equity, unfortunately. You as the leader have to own it and drive it every, every day and make it part of what you are doing. And it requires a lot of consistent effort and prioritization because there's a lot to prioritize in a, in a crisis, and it's easy for that to fall down the list of priorities, but you have to put it up at the top over and over every single day. You cannot delegate it to someone else on your team. Um, that is what changed for, for me uh, as a leader as we went, went forward through, through COVID and would encourage those of you who think about this, about how you can prioritize that for, for, your, for your work uh, so the second takeaway was measuring race and ethnicity was the absolute minimum. Now, we spent a lot of time on that measurement, um, and frankly, we are so bad at it if you look at um, us across healthcare about how much unknown there is in the space. So we, spent a, we should, rightly so, spend more time thinking about measuring race and ethnicity, but honestly, it is like the bare minimum of what we should be doing because what's so important about it is what are you going to do with the data, right? What are you going to do to actionably change how you, how you move through the world because you have that data? And, and, it, and if you're not creating an organization that is a learning organization that uses data, you have to be doing, you have to be doing both, not just measuring it. The relationship building, I think I mentioned a few times here, is so, so critical. And so much of this is about showing up. And that was hard to do in COVID, but um, you know, thinking about how do you engage the community, you have to really be there in person, look folks in the eye, um, and listen um, are so, so critical. Um, I also want to really make the pitch that if you are going to, to do this work, to engage with the community, that is real work. And oftentimes we are leaning on really financially strapped organizations that are trying to do a lot with very little. And we, in healthcare, we have a lot of resources and we need to make sure that we are, are thinking about that. And uh, as we, we, we think about all sides of making a program successful, um, that we really have to resource the community organizations to be able to partner well with us in the healthcare uh, in, the, in the healthcare system. Another is um, on, on leadership communication. I think this is something that hit home for me over and over um, as I tried to stand at a podium and the governor and I tried to find the right words to lead us through a really hard crisis. Certainly we needed transparency, as I mentioned, but simplicity was also really important. Um, repetitive messages where folks could really understand what is the the one thing you need me to remember from this one hour press conference? What is the one thing you need me to do? What is that simplicity? Um, and then lastly, the humility. Um, and what I mean by this is, man, this virus has um, you know, changed and we've learned a lot and we had to watch the scientific process play out in real time, which is new for everybody. Um, but you, if you approached it with a humility that I don't know all the answers as I sit, stand here right today, this is what I know right now. I think if we talked a little less in absolutes, 
like we never have to wear masks again, or we always have to wear masks, or we always are. If we talk a little bit with more humility, I think that will build trust. I think folks understand that things change um, and that they may have to change and move with them. But it's when we um, uh, over over uh, play our hand, if you will, and we don't approach it with humility that I think it breaks down trust and it allows that misinformation to grab hold. And they, they start to see, well, you said over there uh, that you, you, we would never have to do this again. And th those are the places where the misinformation and the distrust really comes to play. So approaching things with transparency, simplicity, and humility are really key. And then lastly, the whole person care really matters. You, we in healthcare sometimes get so fixated on our solutions in our space. Um, and we got to make sure that we remember that health is way bigger than what happens in the four walls of where we work. Um, health is really about what is happening to folks in their communities, and that when we craft health solutions, we can't do it alone from healthcare. We're always going to need to partner, um, and so thinking about how do you do that, I, that is something I very much learned from, from my, my uncle, and how do we think about those systems of care um, that, that are not going to be exclusively healthcare oriented if we really want to help our communities. So those are my takeaways um, from an equity lens around COVID. Just two more, two more things to share. And this is really first, just a little more. So you heard about the professional side of Joel Levine. Let me just share a little more about the family man, uh, Joel Levine. And yes, I am, I am strong enough to, to say like, yes, that is me. That's me with those glasses and that, yes, that's how, that's right. And so the, this is some family photos, um, uh, you know, so, uh, Joel, Frida, and their, their family lived in Denver. I grew up here in, in, in New York. And, you know, we, you know, when, when you're in different parts of the country, uh, you, you know, the, the, the times that you come together are even more, more special. And so these are some of our, our family times uh, together. And there's my, my grandfather, Mike, and Grandma Sophie. Um, and this was one of the, the last times that I got to spend with, with Joel um, um, before his, his passing. Actually, it was weeks before the COVID crisis hit. And I was so grateful um, that I was able to bring my daughters um, out to Denver and spend time with the, the, the family. We, we miss Joel very much. We miss him very much. He was incredible in his professional life, but just know he was just as incredible in his personal life. Um, and I'm so grateful that Downstate can host this lecture on an ongoing basis here, I think both to learn from his professional um, uh, mentorship about thinking about access, thinking about equity, um, but also the humility, I think was, was brought up a lot of times. And if you wanna lead, it's so important to lead with that humility. And so I think he brought that um, it, as brilliant and brilliant as he, he was. We always learn something from, from every dinner conversation <laughs> with, with my Uncle Joel. Um, so we miss him a lot, and I'm grateful that we're able to have this memory um, each and every year and hopefully a place where folks can, can learn going forward. So thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Outstanding. You can see why uh, uh, Dr. L Dr. Levine was so proud of his niece um, and why she was, was so recognized as one of the most innovative uh, leaders uh, over the last two years because of her work in, in North Carolina. Uh, and I had forgotten to mention, I'm glad you did, that, that you worked in the Obama administration as well, uh, M Mandy. I'd forgotten that. So, uh, you know, tremendous background. Thank you. You've done your Uncle, a on, wonderful honor by being the first lecturer, so it was fantastic. We have time for two or three questions, and I'll throw out the first one. Um, I've been at a couple meetings, you know, here in New York City. Uh, Mandy, uh, Mayor Adams appointed me to the New York City. I'm one of the co-chairs of the New York City Recovery Task Force for the whole city. And, you know, we've been having similar conversations to what you have uh, mentioned there. And one of the things that I keep trying to stress whenever we have, uh, you know, meetings of the task force with the mayor and his team is, look, there is no um, Brooklyn COVID, there's no Queens COVID, there's no Bronx COVID. And in your world, back in North Carolina, you had to work with 
your Republican boss, I mean, a Democratic boss, Governor Cooper, but you also had uh, two tough houses of the uh, North Carolina legislature that were controlled exclusively uh, by Republican elected officials. And so how did you navigate that difficult, choppy water of dealing with Republicans who didn't like some of the things you were telling the state of North Carolina citizens to do, such as wearing a mask, get vaccinated, et cetera. They probably didn't, some of them didn't like that you took your shot on TV with Reverend Barber, who is just an outstanding civil rights leader. I've, I've known, uh, met Reverend Barber and, and admired his work in terms of not just COVID, but just economic justice in North Carolina and around the country. But tell us how you navigated the politics and then we'll take maybe two questions. Sure, um, one of the things that um, I learned from, from mentors before I went to North Carolina was that, you know, everyone's just a person and everything's about relationships. Um, and this is, I learned from uh, Sylvia Burwell, who was the Secretary of, Secretary of Health for, uh, for President Obama. And she was incredible at um, building relationships across the aisle. She would, we'd be in a meeting and, a, and an alert would come on her phone and be like, oh, it's, it's so-and-so's birthday today or so-and-so's wife's birthday or so. And she knew everyone's kids and and across you know and at first she tried to know everyone as a human being and that's what I tried to do when I first arrived in North Carolina I wasn't from there I'm from New York I worked on Obamacare gosh how was I going to build bridges with folks um, but luckily before COVID came I had three years to do that and I think that was a really important time where I built a lot of bridges we worked together on a lot of shared issues we actually worked um, one of the things I think brought us together um, across North Carolina was actually working on the opioid crisis something that was really hard hit across the nation, but particularly in North Carolina. And folks, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, an issue that brought us all together. And I was able to help um, folks see that no matter where they sat along the political spectrum, they had a role to play in helping uh, to solve the, the, the crisis. And we actually made a ton of headway. But I also think it built some trusted relationships as we went into crisis. And while we didn't always agree, there was a respect. Um, and I think that respect started with, with my boss, the governor, who I will say as a politician is the best listener I have ever encountered. Um, and so I think he set the tone for that listening posture. Didn't mean we always agreed, right? There were, there, there were definitely disagreements, but the respect was there. And I think that changed the discourse and the dialogue from the beginning. And I think there, you didn't see the kinds of incredible vitriol that you saw in other places in the country. In North Carolina, sure, we, we had our, you know, our share of, you know, no masks or what, what have you, but it really wasn't at the same intensity that I saw in other places. And I think because it started with that respect and probably one of my more proud moments was the last time I went in front of the last oversight committee hearing. We're just talking about state budgets. My last time in front of the General Assembly telling them, you know, and them questioning me, why didn't you do this? Why did you do that? Um, at the end of that, it chair, chaired by the Republicans, I got, you know, got a standing ovation from the Republican and, and Democratic members of that, because I think that they recognized we really tr worked so, so hard to try to bridge divides. Um, and again, I think it started with relationships. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Question. Yes, sir. Um, 
Great, great question. First, I would say we, we're still working on Medicaid. And even though I have left the government, I have not let, left that issue behind. And I actually still think that there is a window of opportunity because of the relationship building through COVID that, we may, that may still happen in North Carolina. But the way we were able to help folks who did not have access to insurance coverage um, was to really use our COVID dollars from the federal government that had to fill those, those holes. And we use them pretty directly, um, whether it was creating these support programs where maybe I couldn't pay for all of their, the, the medical things through our COVID dollars. We could use the support programs around it. Certainly, we could pay for testing and, and the vaccines were free and, and what have you. Um, I was actually quite disappointed in the way the federal government set up the uninsured pot of, of money to help folks uh, get, get things paid for. I would have done it very differently. Um, and so I, I don't think those are actually accessed as much as they should have been from North Carolina. And because we saw that it was going to be such an administrative burden and basically not accessed, we almost recreated, we, we were able to create a pool of dollars to help with uncompensated care for our hospital systems, for our other large providers in order to help, help them through this. Um, so we, we used our own COVID dollars, but those, those are COVID dollars that I could have used for something else if we had Medicaid expansion. But we, did, we were able to have that flexibility to um, pl plug some of those holes with the, with the COVID relief dollars that came to the from the federal government. Yeah, what a fantastic question. Um, I mean, the short version is it takes prioritization and leadership, number one, um, and then it takes sustainable funding, but it takes the creativity often at the state and local level to make sure that you are taking advantage of those um, streams of funding um, to make things sustainable. So you saw that there is some work that we did prior to COVID and we were able to access dollars in different ways and think creatively about that. Um, I will say that I, I spent a lot of time mobilizing our philanthropic community in North Carolina around a shared goal. They were giving lots of money, I think, to important things, but it wasn't cohesive. It didn't have a, um, a shared um, uh, prioritization uh, amongst it. And so actually, I, I spent a lot of time as a state leader helping philanthropy to see a unified way for them to sustain um, some of the, the equity, or frankly, to start the equity work, and then use some of the government programs to then look at a sustainability pathway. I think that there are a lot of really great government programs that can be used in a much more equitable way if if we had some front end ways to make them more accessible, right? Here's a great example in, in North Carolina. We, in the, our Medicaid program covers a lot of mom, moms, young moms who are either pregnant or just, just had a baby, and they are also eligible for WIC. So they're al eligible for things like food, food uh, groceries or, or diapers or formula, what have you. And for, we know that they are eligible for it, but only about 30% of moms actually are, take advantage of it. And it's not because they don't need help with free diapers, it's because the program was, was so complex and it required an in-person visit every 30 days. Why is that necessary? And I will just say, as a new mom, the last thing I could think about was like getting my newborn into a car to go to some random you know, state office. Um, so, we completely revamped 
how we do, you know, WIC assessments. And we essentially now, if you are eligible for Medicaid, you're automatically eligible for WIC. We've completely rechanged how we do that. So I think there are ways, the short, the, the longer version of that, the answer, there are ways to access resources. You got to be clever about it. You got to be creative, but to sustain equity um, in investments and, and driving towards health. But it has to start at the top with leaders who are willing to prioritize that um, and, and make some of those data and technology investments to facilitate things, and then also building that trust with the community at the same time. So again, I think it really does take it all hands on deck, but I do think that there is some sustainable funding um, that we aren't taking advantage of, that, that if we, we have the right leadership, we absolutely could. One more. Last question. Going once, going twice. All right, great. Okay. Let's give Dr. Cohen a wonderful round of applause. <laughs> Let me close out. Let me close out. Well, again, uh, colleagues, thank you for coming uh, to honor this great man, uh, a distinguished uh, son of downstate, who went out with his downstate degree uh, and changed communities, and I would argue the world. And we honor the memory, the work of Joel S. Levine, MD. We're delighted that the Cohen and Levine family can be here uh, to see uh, one of their progeny continue his great work. And so it's incumbent upon us here at Downstate to, uh, to continue uh, all of this, uh, which we do on a daily basis so well. So again, thank you very much. What a great way to start this lecture. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for your wonderful. Thank you very much. We take your picture.